All right, I know what you're thinking. Before I even start this video, you're probably thinking, what is this roller coaster ride that Edward's trying to bring us on? Last week, he said that the study showed that intermittent fasting and caloric restriction wasn't different. There was no difference. And now he's telling us that this study shows that there is difference. Yes, because context is king. And by that, I mean, you have to understand the context of where that study lies in comparison to another study with similar characteristics. The study that I am about to talk to you now and break down for you is the study that every single person who is toting that specific study that was just released does not, I repeat, does not want you to know about. They don't want to talk about it. If they're gun ho about that study, they are hoping that this study gets buried. And I'm gonna go ahead and break it down for you in this video. Stay tuned. Okay, quickly before we start, this video is brought to you by The Coldest Water. If you're looking for a water bottle that's going to keep your water cold, look no further because this water bottle can keep your water cold for up to 36 hours. That's right, not 24 hours, but 36 hours. So you never have to worry about your water not being cold ever again. If you want your coldest water water bottle, the link will be down in the description below. You can enter the promo code FLEDGE and you'll get 10% off your entire order. Now let's go ahead and jump right into the video. Now I've been itching and dying to make this video right here. And I'll be completely honest with you. A lot of people that are super happy that that study that just came out that I touched on last week came out do not want you to know about this study. And the reason that they don't want you to know about this study is simply put, it has much better, much, much better characteristics than that study with very similar methodologies. And let's compare and contrast the similarities. They use resistance trained males. This study used resistance trained males. That previous study had resistance trained male under resistance training protocols. This study had resistance trained male under resistance training protocols. During those protocols and that previous study, they had the researchers there looking at the participants, going through the process. Same thing with this study. That previous study looked at maximal strength, looked at arm size, thigh size, body composition. So did this study. You see where I'm getting at here? They are very, very similar. That previous study had the participants give in their dietary notices of what they were eating. This study did that. That previous study equated for protein and macronutrient intake as well as calories. This study also equated for protein, macronutrient intake, and calories. So there you have it. It's the same methodology. They're looking at body composition. They're even looking at blood lipid profiles, blood concentration, looking at the insulin within the hormones via the blood, looking at all of these different things, the testosterone, all of these different things. They're looking at it in both of these studies. But, one huge but, to understand systematically the importance of each individual study and where they lie. You have to look at the methodology of each study. Simply because a study is newer or a new study does not elevate it above a previous study if the methodology is weaker than the previous study. Now, I spoke about that previous study because it's a recent study that came out and it's data. We have to look at all data, it's important. But that study, by no means, trumps the study that I'm about to talk about right now. Because although those were the similarities, the similarities kind of start and end right there. And yes, the mean age of the participants were 20 year old males, but after that, the methodology win goes to the 2016 study. Now let's go ahead and talk about that study. Now the study was released in the Journal of Transitional Medicine in October of 2016. And if you're in the mindset of, well, that previous study showed me that resistance trained males, well, they can't do intermittent fasting or they shouldn't do it because there's no benefit to it. And this study will definitely disagree with you because even though they did use resistance trained male, the criteria to enter was at least six months of training. Six months of resistance training, three to four days a week. The criteria for entering this 2016 study was five years of continuous training three to five times 
per week. Five years, not six months, five years. So these were aggressively resistance trained males. These were legitimately resistance trained males. Anyone can start going to the gym for six months and be an average person who went to the gym for six months. If you're going to the gym consistently for five years, you are a true resistance trained male. Now you might be saying to yourself, okay, well, sure, but you know, that previous study had more participants and so that sample size is better. Mm -mm. This study had more participants than the previous study. And if you equate for the characteristics and the methodology and how you test and what you're looking for and how you do the testing, then the sample size being larger is a benefit. And this study, unlike that previous study, had 34 resistance trained males, with 17 doing the time-restricted feeding method and 17 doing the normal diet method. That previous study only had 13 doing the time-restricted feeding method and 13 doing the normal diet method. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, the other study had a, a, a longer fasting window, so that shows that there's no consistency in the fasting protocol. Nope. It didn't. The fasting window is the exact same. It's 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating, just like this study. They're near carbon copies, except this one has a larger sample size. And before you even make the argument that, well, you know, four weeks is a good amount of time to show you that, no. The longer the time frame, the better. The larger the sample size, the better. This 2016 study doubles the 2020 study in terms of time frame, because unlike that study where they only looked at four weeks, this study looked at eight weeks. So it's resistance trained males under resistance trained protocols doing either time restricted feeding or normal dieting within an eight week time frame. Not a four week time frame, eight week time frame. So, now that we got that separation cleared, these are the reasons why the people who are happy about this 2020 study don't want you to know about this study because this study basically slaps that study down. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't make any sense. Then why would the 2020 study not advance on the protocol of this study? Because that's just how science works. Sometimes they don't have the resources or they don't have the capabilities of doing something that's better, like maybe 12 weeks. No, they were only able to do four weeks with less people because that it just ended up being that way. They have to omit certain people because somebody may have been using uh, performance enhancers or they just didn't qualify or they dropped out. Those are just things that you have to deal with. And then resources in terms of financial resources or even the amount of researchers you have just doesn't let you advance the methodology of the study and they worked with what they had. So there's no knock on that. It's still a good indicator of what could happen within a four week period. Uh, but a better indicator is what can happen within an eight week period. So now let's look at what happened in this study. Was there a difference in fat loss between the time restricted feeding group and the normal dieting group? Yes. Was there a significant difference in fat loss between the time restricted feeding group and the normal dieting group? Yes. What was that difference? 16.4% fat reduction in the time restricted feeding group and only 2.8% fat reduction just 2.8 versus 16.4% reduction so normal dieting group 2.8% reduction in fat trf group 16.4 now you must be saying oh my gosh they burn more calories this is this is true this this proves that they burn more calories than just eating calories normally without doing a fasting protocol no that's that's not what happened and, and uh, hopefully that doesn't blow your mind it's what the mechanism of fasting has been showing time and time again it is the calorie partitioning it is what it selects to actually burn that's the difference so resting energy expenditure was not different between the two, which means that their resting energy burn in terms of calories burned was the same. It was the same between both groups, but still there was a significantly higher fat reduction, fat burn in the TRF group than the normal dieting group. That is because the body partitioned the body fat and selected that as the fuel 
as opposed to the normal dieting group as seen in an eight week period. Remember the P value to be significant is 0 0.05. This was viewed in the TRF group with a 0 0.0448 indicator, which means it is less than 0 0.05 and it makes it statistically significant. So it isn't that they lost more fat and kind of, but it, you can't really proclaim that it could have happened or maybe there was some type of element that caused it. No, this happened and it was statistically significant. But get this. Fat-free mass, which is essentially the lean tissue, no change. That's right. They held on to their muscle just as well as the normal dieting group. The muscle area around the arm, the muscle area around the thigh, no difference. They held on to their muscle just as well as the normal dieting group. Bench pressing and squatting, maximal strength their ability to actually increase their strength or hold on to their maximum strength. No difference between both groups. They were both able to hold on to their maximal strength. And also this study had a single blind design, which can aggressively reduce bias because the outcome assessment researchers were not aware of who was doing time-restricted feeding or who was doing normal dieting. All they were able to collect was the data of where their body composition were and all of these things and what they were eating, but not if that group was doing TRF or if they were doing normal dieting, which enhances it even more. Oh, and I almost forgot another comparison is that this was also a randomized control study. Unfortunately, they did not do a crossover, but neither did the 2020 study that was just released. So in terms of blood concentration, they saw that insulin sensitivity was increased and they can tell that it was increased because adiponectin was increased in the TRF group, not in the normal dieting group. And adiponectin concentration has been seen to have a correlation with insulin sensitivity. Also, the respiratory exchange ratio, the RER, was reduced in the TRF group, which means that it was using less carbohydrates to fuel energy. And what it was using as fuel instead was fatty acids. So it was basically burning body fat for fuel while the normal dieting group were more aligned with burning carbohydrates consistently for fuel, which goes in line with when you deplete the carbohydrates in your body, you do that metabolic switchover that allows you to tap into body fat for fuel instead. Now keep in mind, although not statistically significant, yes, the muscles were the same overall, but 0.86% was retained in the TRF group and only 0.64% was retained in the normal dieting group, which kind of screws with your mind because, because it looks like the group that was fasting was able to hold on to more muscle, albeit not statistically significant, but still more muscle nonetheless. While, don't forget, burning a statistically significant amount of body fat compared to the normal diet group. So what are the limitations of this study? The same limitations that the 2020 study has. It's self-reported intake, it's a small sample size, but still larger than the 2020 sample size. It's just resistance trained males, which is what you can say for the 2020 study. Testosterone was reduced in the intermittent fasting group, in the TRF group. That was a negative outcome that was significantly different to the normal dieting group. But it did not have any correlation to muscle loss because they still held on to slightly more muscle, even though the testosterone had reduced in the TRF group. Of course, there's better systems that you can use like a metabolic chamber, but that is very expensive, especially if you're trying to keep people in there for about two months. So there it is, guys. This is a 2016 study that completely slaps down this 2020 study. Now, that's not to say that this 2020 study does it matter? It does matter because it's data. What happens within four weeks if you have 13 people doing one protocol and 13 people doing the other? Well, we have an idea. I mean, nothing is set in stone, but that methodology gave us that idea. This shows you what happens if you extend that period and you have more people, which gives you a better indication of what could happen as everyone has different biological characteristics. So the more people you have in the pool, the better of an indicator it becomes to the general public. This is a much better study study and methodology alone as it does everything that this 2020 study does but better and the results show that 
body fat was reduced while maintaining muscle, even though the resting energy expenditure was not significantly different. The researchers even had to admit that maybe the adiponectin increase lended to more fatty acid oxidation, which is why more body fat was lost in that TRF group than the normal dieting group. But nonetheless, they stated that it wasn't because of the differences in macronutrient intake because everything was the same in that respect, as well as calorie intake. And before I go, if you're trying to grab onto one last straw as an anti-intermittent fasting person out there, and you're thinking to yourself, well, if they were to do this study, but allow them to eat as much as they want, then the intermittent fasting group is gonna overeat during their eating window. Are, are you thinking that? Is that is that in your head? Is that the last straw that you're trying to grab onto because this 2016 study in methodology and design is just head and shoulders better than the 2020 study? If you are trying to hold on to that straw, unfortunately, that same year in August of 2016, they did do a study with resistance trained males where they separated normal diet and TRF, and they let them eat ad libitum, which means they could eat as much as they want. And the TRF group ate 650 calories less. So they were able to control their calorie intake better than the group that was normal dieting. Both groups were trying to do resistance training and reduce weight. So no, if you let go of the leash and you're in a fasted group, they usually tend to eat less than the group that's in normal dieting, which is a psychological indicator that you can control your caloric intake better when you're doing a fasted protocol, contrary to what many out there would have you believe. And I'll even link that study down in the description below if you wanna take a look at it for yourself. Of course, as always, I wanna thank my patrons for my Patreon, and I'm gonna go ahead and put their names right up here. And as always, guys, I'll see you on Sunday for another FAQ. Peace!